It's a beautiful, sunshiny day outside, and there's quite a bit of sunshine inside. In late August 2001, at CVPH Medical Center, a place that has been in, in existence for a long, long time. And those people who are regular viewers of Our Little Corner know that we've been focusing on this place with good intentions all year long. Why? You should already know that they're celebrating their Diamond Jubilee. 75 years ago, on January 1st, 1926, this place opened as Physician's Hospital in Plattsburgh. And the rest, as they say, is history. We have had so much fun interviewing the, the rodeo, retired old doctors, the nurses. <laughs> and um, we have had generous comments from our viewers about that. And we're trying to chronicle some of the things that have happened over the years. We're in the inner sanctum. How often do viewers of any kind of television in the North Country get to see this office? <laughs> we feel like VIPs today with President Kevin Carroll. How are you? Fine, thanks, Gordy. How are you? It's, it's great to enjoy your friendship since you've been here. Uh, by now, the public knows that... Uh, <laughs> Although this may not be the swan song today, you're a short timer now. Uh, I, I remind people of that daily. <laughs> <clears throat> what? I, I just want to go back a little bit. And first of all, it's great for you to invite and let us allow us to be a part of everything. I've told our viewers many times a great pleasure has been being connected with the, uh, the foundation here. But to get to know the people who work in and around this place and to have great confidence and watch this facility grow as a regional medical center over the years and you've been you've been a big part of that for how long Kevin? Uh, actually a uh, April of uh, 1984. And time flies when you're having fun. Sure doesn't yeah, it? it does indeed it does indeed. Well I won't say it was a great shock when when I read that you were leaving because you've done it but what precipitated it at this point in your life? Well, I think, uh, Gordy, it's, uh, I've been here for a while. I actually only came for a couple of years yeah. in 1984, <laughs> and uh, here I am. I came to be in the radio uh, business for a couple of years. And look uh, I think someone took the, uh, the strip map about how to get back to Massachusetts. <laughs> right. Anyway, uh, we've done a lot over the years. We've had a lot of good fortune, and, and uh, things are running, uh, I think, very well. We've got, good, uh, we've got a good medical staff. We have a lot of services that we've added over the years that I think are it's an unusually diverse set of services for a town of this size or a county of this size. Uh, we have a we have a good seasoned senior staff, uh, good medical staff leadership. So, the short of it is, I guess I would say that things are running well. Uh, we have good uh, responses from our patients in terms of, are they satisfied with what we do? Do they uh, do they approve of it and so on? And uh, I mean, I know that I, I can kind of see the end, and, and it seemed to me that I could either wait till another couple of years uh, or I could leave while things are going well and while there's good inertia. And I think that's, that's really the best thing to do for the institution. Let's just talk about a little bit about why you took this job here in the first place. Well, actually, I was working, uh, I was in Massachusetts doing a, uh, representing three hospitals uh, for medical legal uh, work. And, uh, and I also had about 1,600 employees I was responsible for. And I'd done that for a number of years and was, was really looking to move and do uh, maybe the next level, a more complex job, and then uh, uh, come back and run a hospital in Massachusetts, most likely. So when I came up here, uh, I had been 13 years at my previous location. Uh, I came up here with the idea that I'd uh, have the chief operating officer job, which is really day-to-day -day operations and do that for a couple of years and then go on and, and run my own place. I, I think what happened was uh, Dave Hannon, who preceded me, was doing some succession planning, and uh, he, the only thing is he didn't let me know that. So he left about a year and a half after I got here, actually, and uh, uh, recommended to the board that they give strong consideration to hiring me as a CEO. So that's, uh, that's what happened, uh, and so here I am. <laughs> that's the short of it. The story is much longer than that. I know it's been a satisfying segment of your career, and it hasn't been without tremendous challenges. But it's you went to bed early and got up, <laughs> and got up early, and uh, you we are where we are. I mean, our uh, the general public is more knowledgeable about how this place works thanks to the great 
publicity we've done by way of public information, but they're also aware of the problems that uh, facilities such as this have had all around the country over the last year or so. And I think while we're here, we might as well do the strokes where they're deserved. You have persevered, and you're in a pretty good place compared to an awful lot of institutions, smaller and larger, around our nation at this time. And that's not a bad way to to leave. Right, <laughs> right. I, I think that's I think that's true. Uh, if you look more parochially uh, uh, and just look at New York State, in recent years, uh, uh, in the last, uh, the most recent year. I think three quarters of the hospitals in New York uh, ran in the red, which means that they they paid more to produce the services uh, that they gave uh, than they received in, in uh, revenue. So it's a uh, it's not a good long term uh, position to be in. We have uh, we have avoided that. I think we've uh, uh, nurtured a very strong uh, business orientation in terms of how we spend our money. Uh, we put anywhere from uh, ten to probably thirteen million dollars a year into new either capital purchases uh, or buildings or programs every year, year in and year out. Uh, because one of the markers of, of health for a hospital is how what, what's the average age of your equipment, your buildings and so on. And uh, we keep uh, putting money back into, uh, into programs to sh assure that we're, we're uh, as current as we can be. Um, we I think those things have allowed us to start new services where we thought there was a uh, uh, a need for them, and we could operate them uh, successfully, and uh, and so we add services, and that brings that puts more people to work, uh, that brings more physicians in, and uh, so there were to give you an interesting uh, couple of uh, comparisons, we had about 850 people when I came here, 850 employees, we now have uh, 1,900. Uh, Do you really? <laughs> Wow, that's yeah. a surprise to me. Yeah, that's uh, that. That's a lot. Uh, we uh, we had then a, like a thirty million dollar budget uh, annual operating budget. We're now in the hundred and twenty million dollar range, um, and we've added. <coughs> we, we had about eighty physicians, and we have now one hundred and forty five. Uh, so you know the population here hasn't changed much, but the notion I had was in is New York is basically pretty restrictive for hospital revenue. And it seemed to me the only way you could increase the revenue would be to add services that would bring people through the turnstile, so to speak, who hadn't c been coming before. And it's been a good, uh, it, it's been a good uh, uh, algorithm, if you will, for, for growing. And we continue to do that, uh, and it's been successful. If Mr. Miner could come back today, boy, would he be in for an eyeful when he drove past that pristine piece of property where this physician's hospital was, was built, that just the physical changes are monumental since I came here in 1961, and the services inside, and the, the clout that this facility and its personnel have in the business on the inside and with the population are tremendous. What we talk about a lot in this, in our foundation and elsewhere, is how the how the North Country perceives what happens mm -hmm. in this medical center. And you mentioned a very important point back in the beginning of this interview by saying, according to the reports you get back, the vast majority of people who come through this facility for one reason or another are delighted with the way they're treated. Yeah, I think they are, uh, and I think that uh, one of the things uh, we and we we compare ourselves. We're, we we participate in a uh, a survey that uh, has uh, at a maximum about 400 hospitals uh, in it, and and they're, they're all comparing the same things. And uh, so we we do pretty favorably. And I I think one of the things that has improved these scores uh, in recent years is we've been working for about 10 years at least on. Uh, <clears throat> improving employee relations, uh, working uh, together with employees more in a partnership model. Uh, and we've tried all kinds of things. Uh, some worked better than others. and uh, uh, But Mike and I uh, stumbled onto something, or we actually didn't stumble on it. We, we kind of shaped it, a, a program in more recent years that, that allows uh, and creates situations where employees can meet with supervisors and managers over a two-day period and, and have a chance to talk about what we do well, how we do it, why we do it, and and uh, more importantly, what we don't do well and how we might change it. And uh, what's happened is I, I think there's, there's more, the, the inclusiveness, if you will, the inclusive model 
uh, it, it tries to create and, and uh, energize the notion that the employees, this is their place of work. They have something to say. They know their jobs a lot better than we do. And so if we're going to say, tell us how we can do them better. And uh, so when the employees feel like they're part of the program as opposed to just people coming and going, uh, they interact with employees, with, with patients uh, more comfortably. They interact with the public more comfortably. And uh, th that's what you need. People come in here and they're not in there always under their, uh, at their best, if you will, when they're ill or when their loved ones are ill. So we need to be nurturing whether you're someone that works in environmental services or the cares for the lawn or whatever. We need to be helpful. And so I think that that spills out eventually. And I think it's the, a lot of the work that's gone on for years is kind of coming, uh, kind of coming uh, to its fullness, but yet there's more to do. I mean, we really have to get better at it still. But I think we have come a, a long ways toward creating in this community in the greater North Country community, an ownership. Mm -hmm. And the more people I talk to, the more people say, our medical center. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good thing when people realize this is their medical center. Yeah. I, think that's, I think that's true. And I, uh, uh, Mike has, uh, has done a tremendous job with uh, taking every opportunity uh, he can find to, to share what we are with the community, with any part of the community, any uh, narrowly focused group, any widely focused group. Uh, uh, and it's not the so we can, gee, you love us. It's rather you know, if people can understand the complexity and the diversity of things that go on here uh, and get a sense of, of how difficult it is to get a good job done, they will more fully appreciate the employees that work here and uh, that they're not always having a good day. Not every employee has a good day. And uh, he's, he's done a great job uh, uh, having the informal story told. And I think then that, uh, you know, in the, in the best of worlds, we've got 1,900 people here who are our salespeople who uh, either have a good place to work and they talk about it at, uh, at home or they have a bad place, and we like to make it a good place. And I, that translates into good, uh, good news for the, for the patients and families. This thing, Mike Hildebrand has to live up to this reputation too, you know. His hat won't fit when we leave this room. <laughs> We're going to have some fun talking about history. We, Calvin and I uh, believe that every time we do a program like this, it, it's a piece of history. Mm -hmm. So people, no doubt, will be viewing this uh, after you've gone into other phases of your life, and me too. And so let's let's uh, just, bef and I know you're so busy, Kevin, and we appreciate the, the few minutes you've uh, allowed us to come in here, but if, in the best of all worlds, what would be your vision for the next five years here at this facility in a general way? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, we need to keep uh, we need to keep operating successfully in terms of operating the black. We need to continue to grow our so-called partnership with our employees because that's uh, that's that's really the the one of the core pieces of of this institution. Because no matter how many services we have, if the employees aren't uh, part of it in making it every day, making it as good as they can then we're going to be stuck. We can put all the services we want in. They are the medium through which we speak and act. Um, but in terms of the medical, uh, the, the medical services, probably more what you're thinking about, uh, we're, at the, we're right at the edge of uh, putting together, a, a, expanding our cardiac, cardiac services uh, to include uh, angioplasty, which is coronary uh, artery angioplasty, which is um, uh, just the next step beyond what we can do now. We are in diagnostic cardiology. We're not in interventional at this point and, uh, and treating. So, <clears throat> pardon me, we're now at the point of, uh, of developing a relationship with St. Peter's Hospital in, in uh, Albany um, to help us get to that next step. We have to work with our cardiologists and we have to work with St. Peter's. We have to get approval from the state of New York. I've already met with the uh, 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 New York State Health Department folks, and I, they seem to encourage us. That will be a that'll be a uh, another premier uh, uh, in defining service for us. Um, we think we have the ability to do that uh, and do it well. Uh, and St. Peter's uh, has uh, probably the best outcome data for not only surgery but angioplasty, their cardiac program in in the state of New York. So if you're going to go, we as well go with the winner. 
I think that that will, for some people, be a little bit of a stretch, thinking, well, gee, you have to go to Albany rather than Burlington. That seems like a long way. Uh, St. Peter's will will literally clear the decks and, and make the make the uh, uh, make it work when people go down there. And, and we've had some people go down there, and they're very pleased with the results. The other thing that I think uh, will help us uh, markedly is that we have someone in, it, uh, in Montreal, in the Montreal area, doing marketing up there. And I think that uh, given the restriction uh, that's impending uh, on, uh, on federal revenues coming in, Medicare, uh, Medicaid, and so on, uh, we will be, like everybody else, stuck trying to figure out where are we going to get enough money to run this place and continue to grow and continue to add the latest services. Montreal, to us, has an incredible potential uh, because there are people up there who cannot get what they need out of the health care system. And what they need is not necessarily the service, but it's when they want it. And there, there is a market there which uh, uh, we think is willing to pay uh, out, of, out of pocket to do things. And so we will be able to grow, we expect, uh, and deal with these uh, folks and provide them something they need. And uh, it's important to say that the sole purpose for this, I mean, we're nice people and everything, but really we want the money uh, I hate to say it, we want the money to be able to grow this facility. And we want to provide a good service to them, but, but our, our responsibility first, uh, first and last is our people here. Uh, and that, that just has an enormous implication. So if, I, if, if five years from today I had to guess the, the two most important things would be the Montreal market and the, and the, uh, the expanded cardiac services program. Terrific. And before we finish this phase of our program today, may I put out a personal pitch <clears throat> For young students, male and female, who are thinking about what career they want to go into to consider the wonderful, personally rewarding uh, profession of nursing. Because uh, we've had problems getting people to go into the field now, and not nearly enough guidance counselors are focusing on this as a tremendous profession. We have ways to train, educate nurses here in our community that, that set us apart. And so in five years, I would like to see a wonderful new batch of nurses who graduate, get that degree, and come to work right here at CBP. I, I think the, uh, we, have, we already have a number of programs going on uh, that uh, uh, will we'll address that issue. Uh, but uh, more to the point, there's, we have what people wouldn't be apt to think of. We have two, uh, 240 different kinds of jobs here. Okay, that's that's uh, that's a rather striking uh, comment. So that what I would do is I'd, I'd expand your comment to say, we need everybody. And <laughs> if you're in high school, the ninth or tenth grade, or if you have a kiddo that's in that in that age range and isn't quite sure what they want to do, we have and will continue to grow. We just started this year. Uh, uh, hospital to school programs will have opportunities for them to come in and work with the volunteers. Let them, uh, chances for them to come in and do what we call shadowing programs. So, yeah. someone if you're a if you're a nurse or if you work in grounds or you work in uh, uh, as an air conditioning uh, specialist, uh, you can shadow or go along, spend some time with that person. Say, gee, that's that's really an interesting thing. Uh, we'll pay for schooling. Uh, so the, the 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 high profile lacking right now is 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 nursing. But trust me. Uh, it's lab techs, it's uh, med techs, it's uh, everybody you can think of. Uh, there just will not be enough people to take care of the boomers who are going to be retiring in the next five or eight years. So it will be a, uh, it, for people in the North Country, most of the people that are born here and raised here will stay here. And it's a great place, it's a great place to work, and I think it's an opportunity. So, uh, Is that a good pitch? I think that's great. Kevin, let me publicly thank your hand. Okay. Shake your hand and thank you for your contribution here. And wish you Godspeed and the best of good fortune in everything you do in the future. My pleasure entirely. Well, if William H. Minor ever knew how hard it was to get his picture <laughs> on our program today without a reflection, turning lights off and turning them on and standing here, but we did it. But he's the guy responsible for it all. And uh, Mike Hildebrand, we wanted to make sure we get you on early in this business because we talked about you so much when you were behind the scenes. And anytime Kevin said something nice, 
I could see him back there saying, yeah, that's true. Yeah. No, I, actually, Gordy, I was almost falling out of my chair, but uh, I appreciated the kind words. Well, you know, Michael, you and I have been associated uh, for a long time, first in the radio business and now in several different capacities, and I know you've enjoyed your career here at CVPH. For how many years? Oh, it it's, will be 10 years the end of October. And uh, I can tell you I've never been anywhere this long, but I've never enjoyed myself as much as I, I had until I came here. We've done a number of programs together, uh, chronicling all the expansions and the, the things away from this particular facility, the campus that goes around the community, and it's, it's fun to watch it grow, isn't it? Right? Oh, I mean, it, it's made my job quite easy because, first off, we do have great people that work here and, and on the medical staff, but we have been a, a very uh, aggressive facility. We haven't rested on our laurels. We've added new programs and new services, and that makes it exciting. And I, I think that's what the community really is, is so pleased about. They see the new things that are offered right here in Plattsburgh, and, and they know that there are good people behind the scenes doing everything. And uh, when you've got a winner, you know, it makes life a lot so easier. Go for it. Well, we have chronicled a lot of those things, and we hope that this is a good part of history. We hope before we finish this program today that uh, people get a slightly different view of CVPH Medical Center and a view of its history through some photographs. And talking about history, I have standing next to me with no further comment about how long she's been here, except to say that it's about 38 years. Mm -hmm. Mary Ellen Everleth, how are you? I'm fine, Gordy, thank you. And none of those comments are going to be added to this tape, except that you were here from the beginning. So what year was it when you came here? I actually started in April of 63. 63, two years after I arrived in this burg really? to begin <laughs> a 36-year radio career. Right. Well, so you're seeing you know, we're compatriots what? in more ways Absolutely. than we know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are you a North Country native? Yes. Yes. My family that is That name, from how here could you help but You be, got right? it. We, um, all my family lives here. and. Uh, uh, the hospital has been such a big part of all of our lives, really. Um, having worked here for 38 years, and uh, you know, my children were born here, and uh, this has been uh, just what this about been my home life. and family. You this got is it. it huh? mm -hmm. This is really right. home turf for you. Right. Well, what uh, what did you do before you came here? Were you a, a teenager when you started here? Uh, actually, 13, I, actually, I love to I love to think that I was about twelve, <laughs> but people haven't believed that story. Uh, and actually, I I started here as a um, after secretarial school as a uh, transcriptionist in the medical um, oh, records no department. Kidding. And I worked there for uh, about a year or so, and uh, an opening became available in administration, and I moved to uh, to that position and. I've been in an administration um, ever since. Well, there aren't many people who have viewed this facility from your kind of perspective um, over the years. It's, um, so we accept, uh, we, we fully expect this interview to, for you to divulge all that secret information oh, about all. Oh, that's, that's, I, I had to swear, uh, you know, to, I'm sworn to secrecy well, here. <laughs> let's talk about some of the top CEOs, presidents and CEOs you've worked under in and what it was like. First, who's well, the first actually, one? the first one uh, was Mr. McLaughlin, James McLaughlin, and he was um, he was here at Physicians Hospital and was my first uh, my first boss. Um, he was here for just a short period of time, and um, the merger occurred um, between the two hospitals, and um, Howard Reed uh, joined uh, the Talk medical about center. Famous names. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to drop a lot of them today. Yes. And Howard was here. Um, from 67 until 76, um, 78 I guess it was, and he brought in David Hannon as COO and David took over when Howard left. David was here until um, 86 and then uh, Kevin uh, arrived and I've been working for him for the last 17 years. It sounds years. so simple, like <laughs> it's just we rode the waves and <laughs> well, uh, Really the key has been flexibility over the years and I think that um, it's been a marvelous uh, career here. I've, I've loved every minute of it. It's been some hard work, but there have been many rewards, um, along with the fact of seeing this place grow so, 
so much and so many changes. It's been just fascinating. Almost before our very eyes, it yeah. changes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, when we, we stop and think about it, um, there was just, uh, you know, the Physician's Hospital here in, in Champlain Valley down the, down the street, and there were split services, and um, once they had the, the vision of combining the two hospitals, I mean, things really took off, and it's, it's been just marvelous. That was an interesting time all by itself, yes. getting these two facilities yes. together until it became yes. CVPH, Champlain Valley Physicians Hospital Medical Center, and then yeah. you uh, had to be doing some stepping and fetching uh, it was a busy period. it was a busy time but uh, such a rewarding time because the people that i was working with and, and the people i've worked with over the years have been just marvelous it's been just um, a great great career that's, so what's in the future for you or do we uh, dare to ask well actually um i have five beautiful grandchildren and i plan oh, to great. bake chocolate chip cookies and meet the school bus often that's <laughs> what my plan is <laughs> So when, when uh, is your tenure here finished? Uh, the end of, uh, actually I'm going to be going out the end of September. My, my uh, retirement isn't until January, but I'm going to use a little benefit time and come back in uh, periodically to give a hand and uh, uh, I'll be finished well, in January. I'm sure this facility is a better place because you've oh, been here you for nice? 38 that's, years. That's very And nice, I know how personally rewarding long tenure at a job can be you know and i was never quite sure if i was just being silly to stay in the radio business for all those years but when you find a place that's comfortable it's hard to buy a new pair of shoes isn't yeah it? well it's been like a new job every time a ceo a new ceo has arrived that's true plus the fact that i've worked very closely with the board and um the new chairman every few years uh and they've been just marvelous people and i've enjoyed it just thoroughly well again yeah. as i said to kevin thank you so much for your contribution and best of everything in the future. Thank you. It's not like we're parting ways right now because yeah. we have a lot to see before we're finished with our little corner today. In the course of our coverage of the Diamond Jubilee celebration in 2001, we needed some historical information in chronological order. And our special thanks to Stan Ransom and his wonderful wife for putting together the Champlain Valley Physicians Hospital historical timeline. We've talked about it a great deal before. We mentioned some of the highlights, and now I'd just like to have Calvin go down through and look at it. Uh, it's nice to see how things came about. What happened in 1922 when the famous Dr. Silver suggested the need for a new hospital? The miners decided to provide the financial support. The site was 100 Beekman Street, now 75 Beekman Street because of a beautiful tree that was here in the grounds and the property was procured and they went to work. And early in 1926, Physicians Hospital opened. We learned from A.B. de Grand Prix that there was a previous Physicians Hospital, but this is the one we're officially talking about being 75 years old. And it was no small potatoes, I might say, as we'll prove to you when we show you more of the photographs. The miners didn't spare the horses when they built this place. This was fantastic. 212 beds, 10 stories, four wings. Remember we talked about the cross? Elevators, four operating rooms, and a cheerful sun parlor on every floor. You gotta love it. So this was big time for 1926 and it's big time for 2001. The merger, as Mary Ellen said, was a big part of the timeline. Um, the Alice T. Minor Center for Women and Children was particularly gratifying for me. All the other things that are off campus are so wonderful. The MRI service, things are changing so often with, with new machinery that costs a lot of money and the North Country has supported all of this. And yeah, we got a website. Of course we have a website as well. The new child and adolescent psychiatric unit opened something that I watched with great anticipation for years to try to get that here. Those are all the things that have happened in uh, the history, and hopefully by the time we return on another date, we'll add other things to the end of this particular timeline. 
Come on over, Mary Ellen, and let's talk about some of these things. And the, contrary to what some people have said today, you weren't around here in 1910. That's a beautiful picture of Champlain Valley Hospital. And look at the flowers, and look at the, oh, isn't that yes, neat? Yes, and just take a look. What is, there are some, oh, these are uh, these horses, are horses and buggies. Horses uh, and yeah, buggies, buggies setting around in a yeah. wonderful field. And uh, you see, uh, Champlain Valley, Hospital for those of you who may not live right here in the Plattsburgh or have been here recently was over off uh, what is now Ruger Street right. in Plattsburgh and parts of that facility remained after it became the college and right and we've mm -hmm. had reports as part of our Diamond Jubilee celebration of bringing the patients over here when the oh in, that in was 1972 quite an that um, it was in May of 72 and it was just a uh, just a marvelous um, organized uh, effort on on everyone's part who was here at that time. Uh, the patients were moved without uh, any any problems or any issues, and um, uh, it was just uh, it was just terrific. I can imagine what the logistics were just oh. in planning for that day and having it having it come off. Right. Well, kind of uh, again, there were a lot of uh, a lot of people involved and. Uh, uh, it, it did. It, it just came off beautifully, and you'd see them coming through the front door, um, you know, all the patients from CV Hospital, and everybody was just very, uh, very upbeat and very, very positive about this move. They were, they were happy about it. We've talked about the gray nuns, and here's an inside view of a ward at Champlain Valley Hospital, the women's ward, in the 1920s. These are delicious photographs, aren't they? Aren't they? They just... I mean, it just tells the story so so well, and and what a great thing that um, Chris has done here um, with her library staff to have um, retrieved these from the hospital archives and uh, preserve them uh, so well, so that everyone here in the community will have an opportunity to uh, get a flavor of she our does history a terrific here. Terrific job! She's a bright lady, Chris Ransom, and of course we love her husband as one of the great icons of the North Country. St. Joseph's Chapel at the Champlain Valley Hospital. It's really quite beautiful. And we have our own little chapel right here, oh, don't we? Oh, isn't that? And we, we really need to give credit to Don Canning oh, yeah. uh, because Don certainly was um, so instrumental in uh, uh, raising funds for that beautiful area. Like everything else, there was a little bit of controversy in the process, but now that it's here, people love it. Oh, uh, it, and it's, it's just such a restful and, and oh, just, beautiful place. Just terrific. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Physicians Hospital at William and Court Street, 1911. This is uh, the original Physicians Hospital facility here in town that A.B. de Grand Prix talked about during our delightful interview with him. Most people before this year were not familiar that there, with the fact that there was a Physicians Hospital before this right, one. Right, right. Pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Now let's move over here. There's an, a, a, a different view of it. Uh, really neat, really neat facility. And next, a bill from 1920. Can you believe that the board and room and care was $4? And this is dated May 29, 1920. <laughs> Unbelievable. I, mean, I, I was able, I, yeah, isn't for it For two wonderful? days. I'm sorry, this is for two days, not just for one. Well, we found some, some, some weekly stays, somebody who stayed six days and somebody who stayed three or four days, and different people have, have let me borrow or given me copies of bills in okay. the process. Mm -hmm. And I've written newspaper columns about them because yes uh, times have changed a little bit just a little so uh, one of those years i think the weekly uh, charge was 26 dollars and a couple of dollars for lab fees <laughs> oh yes we have come a long ways while we stop here for a minute and talk about you talked about uh, uh, an original stock certificate that you had well um yes actually uh, among the the old papers that um uh, i've been going through we found this um old stock certificate that that would have been uh, dated prior to 1926. In 26, the corporation went to a membership corporation, and prior to that time, it was a stock corporation. And um, um, I, I mean, you know, that's I, great, great piece of history, isn't it? And I meant to, I meant to mention that as part of our program today when we talked earlier with Kevin about who owns the medical center, how we try to make people in the community feel, feel a piece of the ownership. This is the community's yeah, hospital. It is. This, this is the, this is 
for the community, and they are owners of this uh, of this facility. That's great. And to feel, have the audience, the the people who live and work out there feel that way. It's very nice when they come in and say, "Yeah, this is our facility." Well, right. When the at the time of the merger, um, the Miner Foundation out of Chicago um, really. Um, designated that this was going to the community. This physician's hospital is, uh, would be uh, the community's hospital. That's great. Yeah. Take a look here at the groundbreaking. I don't know if Calvin had already shot it. The groundbreaking in 1923. <laughs> what a difference. And I'm not sure that this is a, a faded photograph, but we're fortunate to have one circa 1925 of the people who were working to build this facility. It's, uh, it's hard to pick out the faces with my old eyes, but boy, that is, that is really kind of neat, isn't it? And the next photograph is uh, a bit later in the same year, and you can get the feeling of the cross the way things have changed so much now, people don't realize that this is what the original building looked like. Right. Kind of neat, huh? Oh, marvelous. I mean, I can remember coming in here as a little girl into this front entranceway, and there was this huge, huge mahogany staircase that you would come up. You remember well. that? Yep. And, and the, um, the big foyer on the second floor where the switchboard was located, and um, just, just a magnificent uh, area. Part of our Diamond Jubilee series, and we've done several programs now, was to sit a couple of the original early students of uh, the Physicians Hospital Nursing School to sit them down and talk oh, with them uh -huh. about what it was like to come here from some, one of them lived here and one of them did not, came from another area, mm -hmm. and how they became friends and graduated from the Physicians Hospital School of Nursing in 1934 and some of their little known escapades in the process and it was just delicious and delightful and the best part of that whole interview was the fact that those two people became bosom buddies then and they still communicate daily and they're 90 years old isn't it just just, just absolutely. doesn't that say something about the people of the north country though well, we've talked about solariums and sun parlors and all kinds of things, and I mentioned before to our audience, not only on this show, but in previous shows, that this was a pretty classy place when it opened up. And this is a perfect e example, because it's a, it's a picture taken of a sun parlor here, and there was one on each floor, right when the facility opened in 1926. Isn't it just marvelous? And look at the furniture, the, the quality of that furniture that they had here then. Well, in the in the boardroom, in the oh. everywhere, the beautiful mahogany or whatever it was, in mm -hmm. fireplaces, and oh, yeah. it was more like a mansion than a hospital. Right. Well, they certainly had uh, um, the money and the class to uh, make this a, a just a beautiful facility. And because they had the money, they had the some of the eccentricities that go along with being that way, and the miners. William H. Miner wanted things a certain way, and by golly, he got them a certain way. Mm -hmm. And in the very beginning, he didn't want too many colors in here. So strangely enough, even though all these pictures are in black and white and brown and white, it was a long time before color schemes were added to, to the inside of a physician's hospital, which many people may not know. He just thought it would detract you know, something else that I find fascinating is the way nursing, nursing um, the, the clothes that they wear, the garb that they wear has changed over the years with the caps and so Oh, on. I don't think you can find a nurse with a cap on anymore, Isn't can you? amazing? <laughs> I didn't really like it when they changed. Oh. It's like the, the nun's habits, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And, and you could tell by the cap. Who was who? Who was who. Right, Isn't right, really and they just look so professional, and, and uh, although I would have hated to have ironed those uniforms oh, can back you then. Imagine? Starch them and iron them? Oh, I don't think so. But many, <laughs> some people who are viewing this program today may not realize until we mentioned it that, yes, there was a nursing school here, and there were rooms, and the people, they boarded here. Mm -hmm. They stayed here back mm -hmm. in those days. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the nursing school was transferred to... Um, Clinton Community, I think in 79, 78 or 79. 
and um, Agnes Pearl was uh, heading up our school at that time when the uh, transfer took what place. What a wonderful lady she is. Isn't she? It's She's just absolutely terrific person, yes. Agnes. And uh, there are other names which we're, we're going to leave out, not because we intend to, but people whom we for forget to mention. But it's, you know, you don't get here from there without a lot of people making tremendous contributions. Oh, here. absolutely. And there have been just so many marvelous people who from have the candy worked. stripers to you the got physicians, it. to yep. the CEOs, to the gals who work behind the scenes. It's just terrific. It is. It is. And, uh, you know, our housekeepers, our, our facilities yeah. uh, fellows, um, all of those uh, every day make such a contribution to keep this place uh, going and, and have done so over the years. It's, uh, uh, again, this is a marvelous institution. I think uh, what it must be like for the maintenance crew. Calvin and I were mentioning that before we did this program. Imagine what it takes to keep this place spick and span on a daily basis. I mean, just think of your own home, trying yeah. to keep your own home clean. And um, what, how much effort has to go into this place. And they do it so well. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Dr. Silver, standing orders, February 14th. Oh, Valentine's Day, 1925. I never noticed that here before. Fracture cases, dislocations, etc. Having pain may have aspirin and soda. How about that? <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? And how much, how much soda bicarb you can get and how much aspirin for children and adults? And morphia? Not to be ordered until the aspirin has been tried and no results obtained. I love it. <laughs> Isn't that terrific? I don't know where the, where were some of these things were found. Well, um, actually, um, we we had, used to have a room up on the eighth floor, and it seems like everybody had just kind of dumped a lot of uh, artifacts and and whatnot there. And uh, Chris and her staff went through there and um, organized and got it put together. And and this happened to be among those those papers. I don't think anybody realized how delightful this. Diamond Jubilee year would be in terms of bringing back memories. Mm -hmm. For Calvin and I, it just thrills us to, to check into the history of things. And we've been around here, he all of his life, and me for most of my adult life. And there, we've learned so much every time we come well, back yeah, over and, here. Uh, but what, what happens is we take things so much for granted. We do. And we really don't um, realize, um, unless we give it some thought, uh, about how much people have put into this place and have made it what it is. And yeah. it's, uh, it's marvelous. We have a pretty good product yeah, today. Well, let's look at some more pictures. <laughs> we mentioned the name of Dr. Silver and showed his photograph before, but he was around here for such a long time and impacted so many lives. The very young people now whose grandparents were delivered, you know, back in the era of Dr. Silver, whose idea it was to to uh, put this facility here, so it's proper that we should have his photograph on the wall, I guess, well, Mary Well, you know, he was, he was so well regarded, and, and I have to tell you that um, it was shortly after I started here um, that he died, and um, they had uh, his coffin up on the, in the boardroom. Come on. On the seventh floor. Oh uh, and um, a little known They had some call, calling hours. Um, here. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes perfect sense yeah. now that oh, you think yeah. about it. Yeah. <clears throat> and in those days, people were generally not waked in funeral homes anyway, but it was perfect no. that he would be here. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely incredible. You thought I was kidding when I said there was a certain amount of uh, opulence, almost decadence here in the 1920s. Take a look at the, what is said to be the fireplace in the reception room with a tribute to Dr. Silver. That's pretty neat. And we were trying, Mary Ellen and I were trying to figure out a minute ago where that was. I have no idea. I, I'm not really sure where that room was located, but it certainly uh, is uh, um, overwhelming when you look at uh, that beautiful fireplace and the, the furniture. Um, not much of what existed in 1926 is still around except inside some of the old walls here. Before we finish today, we're, we've been already promised that we're going to go way upstairs because you listen to the old doctors re 
retired old doctors, as they call themselves, and the rodeo doctors about what it was like to do operations with an audience and an auditorium, mm -hmm. and you know, mm -hmm. and because these were learning, these were learning mm -hmm. students were here to learn and watch them operate, and they could. Mm -hmm. Do a little bit on the patient and look out and see Lake Champlain out of one of the windows. And it must have been an incredible experience back in the 1930s and 40s. And uh, it's difficult to get them on tape, but I'm sure you can see them, paintings of Dr. and Mrs. Silver, because they're such an important part of uh, the history of the present CVPH Medical Center. The beauty of having somebody with us who's been here for 38 years is that, yes, uh, we can identify some of the people and some of the photographs that were not the ones that date all the way back to 1926, but Mary Ellen, this one says boardroom physician's hospital circa 1926, but it's, it's more like another era, uh, um, at least uh, some years after that. Yeah, the people in this photograph are people who were here in the early 60s, and um, so... This we'll is just more, have to more change. like my early tenure and your early tenure. Here. Right, right. But you, you saw the back of somebody's head. You recognized yeah, it. Yeah, actually, that was Jim McLaughlin. And uh, Dan McGinley is also in that picture, and he was controller at that time of the physician's hospital. Um, so this had to have been probably 62, 63. We're also fortunate that we have so many photographs from the very beginning, aren't we, Mary Ellen? Oh, we are. We are just... Uh, just really blessed uh, and we will keep those very very carefully because this is this is our past it's, and, and it's and it's it. so great to be able to get all the pictures on tape all at one time so our, mm -hmm. so our viewing audience and we have many viewers all over the north country and other counties other than uh, Plattsburgh can see what life was like here 75 years ago for those of you who've been patients recently at the CVPH Medical Center or have visited here, imagine, if you will, what life was like one year after this facility opened as Physician's Hospital. And when they say deluxe room for patients in 1927, they're not kidding. I wouldn't mind having a bed like that at home, would you? Man, a life, I bet uh, if that were to go up for auction, uh, you wouldn't be able to touch it. Some of that furniture still could be existence. Some of it may be up at the Alice T. Minor um, Museum in Shazy. I'm not certain, but uh, that's really, really quite beautiful. Seeing this frontal view across the pond of Physicians Hospital 74 years ago reminded Mary Ellen of the day the pillars came down. Oh, it was it was just an awesome, awesome sight to watch those pillars just crumble, and um, uh, it was uh, it was really breathtaking. That was par a part of the of the uh, the image that we all thought about when we looked at this facility for so many years mm -hmm. and I was trying to determine when what when those pillars came down what year would that be? Oh, I, I um, it would have had to have been um, late 68 or early 69 when the construction started for the R building um, and of course that that um, was completed in 72 um, and in May the patients were moved from CV over over would, here. Uh, while we're at it I would I venture to guess that because that was such a momentous time that somebody may have been here taking uh, some maybe eight millimeter film of that. It's possible that the television station, which had been in existence many years by that time, had has some old uh, film footage, but it's also po possible that some of our viewers have some old photographs or old movie film of that particular day or anything else that might be of interest. Mind you, we still have a few months left in this uh, Diamond Jubilee year of 2001 as we're filming this in late August. So if people uh, do have some some memorabilia that they might want to loan or donate to make copies of, I guess they could probably contact Chris, huh? In the oh, library. sure. Chris Ransom? She, would, she would be just thrilled to hear from anyone who might have something uh, to add to this collection. So we all would be thrilled. Let's look in the archives, folks, and let us know. The tunnel, the tunnel. 
We haven't had a tunnel here in a long time, but we did way back when, Mary Oh, Ellen. yeah, I remember a little girl going through that, that tunnel, and that was really uh, uh, an experience. Um, certainly, it, it kept you uh, nice and dry on rainy days. Well, there, there it says the tunnel from the hospital ends in the building at the right, 1928, a c couple of years after Physician's Hospital opened. Calvin made the remark, oh, look, they had an antique auto show. <laughs> but yes, we do remember the tunnel, and we were trying to remember where the tunnel came out, whether it's right to the left of where we're um, recording today or whether it was down closer to the snack bar. And the jury's out, but I'm sure somebody will let us know oh. among our many, our many viewers. In case there was any question in your minds or anybody else's mind, Dr. Silver, the chief of the medical staff at Physicians Hospital, ran the show. Mm, that's my he? understanding. <laughs> he certainly did. He was quite a guy. And for so many years, like A.B. de Grand Prix, he, he practiced his profession for a long, long time in the North Country. And that's a, a great, if not absolutely candid shot of Dr. Silver. Does it look like he posed? Look how straight his back is. Take it. a look at the great old pedestal it. telephone. The clean desk. And the I mean, the flowers, the fresh flowers and the clean desk. This guy didn't look too busy, did he? <laughs> I don't know if that's a Bible or a medical book on, <laughs> on the corner of the desk. But are, are you sure Hildebrand wasn't here back in 1929? Because that's pretty, pretty neat. Calvin wanted to show us a picture of the picture that was on the wall. And uh, we have no idea what that picture is, but once again, some of our astute uh, viewers might be able to tell us it looks like some ancient doctor in the Middle Ages or later sitting on a, like on a box and pouring over some notes, but an interesting choice to be on the wall of uh, Dr. Silver back in 1929. Well, at least I remembered the wood right. It was mahogany trim, and you can see that uh, when I said none of the, no expense was spared when they built Physicians Hospital in 1926, we weren't kidding. A beautiful clock was there along with the mahogany trim in 1930. There's a classic photograph before the days of snow tires in a winter scene and, in front of the hospital. And don't they just look so, so proud and pleased to have this beautiful ambulance uh, uh, readily available. You know, part of our, part of the great interview we did with a couple of the nurses who graduated from the school here were talking about the ambulances they had back in the 1930s, and that was even before, before uh, the 1940s when this particular one was, uh, was taken, but they said the hospital always had an ambulance. Pretty neat, oh, right? Yeah. yeah, I didn't realize that, but. 1953 aerial? Yeah. yeah, look at that. 1953, some daring pilot came down close enough to get a, a picture, but it does give us a nice perspective with the nurse's residence mm -hmm. there, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Yes. Well, I think there's an office Very interesting picture here of Dr. Silver and Mr. Whitehall by the tree stump, and that uh, commemorates the dedication of the nurse's residence in 19. 54, 54. Right. and Mary Ellen pointed out, forever the sharp lady that she is, that that stump is gone and there's a building there and we've brought the plaque inside. Right, right. it's located in the lobby yeah, um, of in. the hospital, yeah. That's kind of neat. For old people like me, 1960 doesn't seem that long ago, but then you look at the scheme of things and it's 41 years, but that's the way, what it looked like 41 years ago, huh? Oh, and how it's changed today. <laughs> how much it's changed is right. How the whole area has changed if you want to look around in the communities. It was so neat to view the, that old uh, movie footage we had from the 1920s and seeing the cars go by and the old trucks go by out front. It's really, really great. This is a year or so past the, when the columns came down. <laughs> right. That was uh, the construction of the new front of the Physician's Hospital in 1970. Pretty good, huh? Oh, yeah. Sounded like in the background the columns were coming down again. It was just somebody moving something. <laughs> Life goes on in spite of the fact that uh, Calvin would love to have everything stop here when we start our... No. <laughs> we pride ourselves on being very informal because we just don't know any other way. 
Well, here's something that came along in the 1970s. Boy, that's pretty modern for the 1970s, isn't it? The CVPH Medical Center Healthsmobile. They're, they're everywhere, like the bookmobile, right? Oh, absolutely. They um, Actually, this was a, a thought of Howard Reed's. Um, um, he had a little joint effort with Blue Cross, and they uh, put this van together and tra traveled around the North Country taking blood pressures and um, uh, helping people um, out in the... Uh, um, hinterlands here to uh, keep track of their uh, their health status. And, and you know uh, what? We still do those kinds of things today. Yeah, yeah. And when you think back, I mean, um, there there wasn't much of that going on in, in the 70s, so uh, uh, there was a lot of um, forward thinking, I think, is uh, what we want to say about that. The move. We've talked about it several times today and many times in the past, and Dr. Walker was telling me what was it, what it was like because he was there helping to supervise that move from one place to the other. And it, uh, as we've mentioned before, it happened in 1972 uh, on May 15th, as a matter of fact. I had forgotten that until right now. That was quite a day. Oh, that was a, just a, a, a happy day, a marvelous time for uh, for the staff, and um, uh, because they were coming to to work at a new facility, and the patients uh, uh, were pleased with their accommodations here in the new building, and uh, it, it was uh, it was a uh, just a marvelous time. And here we are again more about the move you can see the nurses and those people around and once again i rem of course i remember it very well having covered it on the radio i didn't take pictures back in those days but it was uh, a extremely interesting for everybody involved and it was it was uh, something that brought a lot of the public out to see what was going on and everybody talked about it in big headlines in the newspaper and 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 just the organization that went yeah. into the process was uh you know, would make you stop and, yeah. and think. It's probably something you wouldn't want to go through again. <laughs> probably <Okay>. not. <laughs> Mike uh, Hildebrand was telling us uh, about how he was participating in putting together a timeline of the early days, the Champlain Valley Hospital and Physicians Hospital, and how long it was before any real expansion was done. Finally, expansion was done at uh, Champlain Valley Hospital, and there was a there was a long period of time, 20-some years, before anything major was done, and that expansion was done at Champlain Valley Hospital. And now, just in the four years or so that Calvin and I have been doing our little corner since 1997, unbelievable changes. Mm -hmm. This uh, CVPH Medical Center, Fitzpatrick Cancer Center, uh, when that opened, that was a glorious day for the North Country. We have special celebrations, survivors celebrations every year with those wonderful, heartfelt and emotional stories. We're now working with uh, cancer patients from across the border quite often who come down here to get our tremendous care and uh, that facility alone is one of the tremendous advances. Oh, uh, the care that's rendered there, the staff is, is just so wonderful with the patients and, and you know, you talk to some of those patients and it just, you know, does your heart good because they, they are so happy with the care that they get there. So many heartwarming stories uh, here in the North Country, and we tell as many as we can right here in our little corner. Mary Ellen Everleth, I want to thank you for allowing us to be a part of your day and being such a gracious hostess here oh, with the it, photographs. It's actually been my pleasure, Gordy. Thank you very much for uh, for doing this, and I hope I hope your audience enjoys the uh, yeah. the old photographs and a little bit of the history. I'm sure they will. And before we leave, I would be remiss if I didn't offer my personal thanks and the thanks of this entire North Country for your significant contributions oh, over the last 38 it's, years. It's honestly, I could not have had a better career than here at CVPH and I, I've enjoyed it thoroughly and I've just loved the people that I've worked with and I've been fortunate, really fortunate. That's what Thank I say you. every time I turn a corner in life. <laughs> somebody say, how was it? I say, it's been fun. <laughs> Oh, we found some neat stuff. We're uncovering new stuff all the time. Hal Merrill, how are you? Very good. How are you? That, I'm doing great. What's that picture we're looking at? 
this is one of the things I maintain here, which is part of the facilities department. This is a book that uh, was found in the basement here about 10 years ago. It is the hospital, was made for the hospital in 1926, and it shows floor by floor what the hospital looked like in 1926. Uh, what we're looking at here, we're on the, is the first floor now, but actually in 1926 would have been the basement. No kidding. The first floor actually was, you came in on the, on the large set of steps, you came in the second floor by the outpatient waiting room. Of course you did. So when we look at this, Look at that picture. And this picture shows what was a laundry oop, as yeah, I I flub it. it. Shows a laundry room that was down here. And for a hospital in 1926 to have its own laundry room. That's and Mr. Miner was ahead of his time and let's let's have everything right here. In so many ways. Yeah. This would have been down this hallway, and my guess would have been to the left hand side here, maintaining a full laundry. On the right hand side. <laughs> it's, me, it's hard to hold all that down. stuff at the there. same time, yeah. On the right hand side you would have had the linen room and the sewing room so they did their own repairs right here and that would have been pretty much down the right hand side here which is now our uh, medical records so we just reuse redo recycle but it is fun to be able to look at the old pictures and figure out where things were isn't it and that's i think the last 10 years for me would the fun part has been to have the book and to try and go through the, the old part of the hospital and figure out where these pictures were taken which a lot of these rooms certainly don't look like this anymore. Oh, that's neat. How, just for the benefit of the rest of our audience, what, what do you do here? Uh, I work security and I drive the ambulance. Uh, this is my 19th year. So Come on. I, yeah, it's been here quite a while. Oh, I think uh, of him as a teenager. And still doing this. And, it, and like I said, as I make the rounds here every day, which I do have to cover everything in the hospital, well, in 19 years of making rounds, you get a little curious as to why did it look like there used to be a door there? Why did it look like there was a window? And how come the floor kind of has a bump here? And this has helped. And it makes my job a little more interesting. Oh, that's great. Are we going to look at the old morgue? Yes, let's head that way first. Let me pick this up and we'll head that Take way. Take your time. All right, boy, we're in the old morgue. You promised me. And now what, it, what is it now, Hal? This is now the Biomed Clinical Engineering. And as you can see by the equipment that uh, Roger James is working on at the moment, uh, this is where we maintain most of the things that work in the hospital. Uh, we know it was a morgue. We could look here. It, what you had at this time was it had four separate compartments, which of course back in 1926, what they had to do was uh, put ice in between the stretchers. So you would have big blocks of ice, which is why you have a kind of hollow yeah. spot. Stretchers would probably will not roll out, but stre Ooh. stretchers still roll out. <laughs> and had enough room for four so the amazing part to me is that they left them here and we we just walled them up so uh, incredible? this when i first started here in the early 80s this was where we stored the records which are now off site but this is where we stored all our medical records in the file rooms and of course we had one girl that would work in here that never wanted to be left alone in here <laughs> i can imagine why i'm just in the process of finding out about the the ghost history of this medical center and I, maybe she's the one i want to talk to <laughs> uh, i know that she never worked late i can tell you that much and oh. um, these originally had metal doors on them and the gentleman that's working in here now roger james found it more useful we put the wooden doors on him and he's actually trying to convert them into some storage for himself because he's quickly running out of room here makes perfect sense to me let's move on well hey we're in the kitchen i always like to be in the kitchen but well, that's what the kitchen looked like in what year this was 1926 and in fact probably in the 50s this was converted as we did the additions outward the kitchen moved to the other side of the hallway here and then eventually in the new addition moved to the front uh, what you're looking at now here is purchasing. This is where we our storages come in every day and uh, the hundreds and thousands of deliveries that come in here, this is where they are cataloged until we need them. Uh, well, you what, look at a brick wall here and you you saw that in the picture, this, right? This on the right-hand side of the picture. Is here where our the foods were prepared, were actually cooked on the other side of this wall, um, somewhere just above the uh, ceiling here you can see the vent that would have come through yeah in fact if i can push this it's still there is it really and the interesting thing was the cook lived on ground the cooks had to live on site so behind you here where behind you see the Calvin, stairway we see the stairway in the picture and now 
We see the stairway in reality. And that is where the cook would have lived 24 hours a day, just in case someone at 2 o'clock in the morning decided that, hey, I want a ham sandwich. Oh, so man. he was on site. Uh, actually, if you want to take a, a walk, quick walk up the stairs, there were two different residents here for the a master cook and the general cook. So that would, I guess that would be. <laughs> How about I love this, a stairway to nowhere. This kind of ends. Where? What was this for? This would have been the master cooks. He okay. would he would have had the upper apartment. Uh, this actually ends up, um, if I'm correct, somewhere up about the facilities office, oh. upstairs <laughs> on the second floor. This would have been his quarters. Back here would have been the assistant cooks, general cooks. Um, th I think there was living space for three. And it's still pretty much, the walls are still intact. We haven't done much remodeling here. You know, it's really neat to be able to get into the bowels of this building and, and see some of the actual original construction. And that's what's very, very nice. It gives us a tremendous perspective on where we've been and perhaps even where we're going. Look at this great stuff where they just knocked things out and added beams. It, and actually, the, the ceilings were 10 foot at that time. So you had 10 foot ceilings that sit back here. It would have been all cement. In the front, uh, Mr. Miner had the nice... Uh, either red mahogany or oak that lined the ceilings, which gave us some de decor. Uh, back here would have been just plain. Yeah. Uh, in the back here, you would have had your storage bins, your potato bin, your whatever they were storing. These were the two bins. That, as far as I know, it's the only two walls we've ever knocked out. That pretty much is how it would have appeared, but this one has been redone a bit. On the right side. Oh, so that would have, been, would have been your storage bins. That's great. Okay, we've just come down those stairs, and we're now going into the root cellar here. Gordy's, uh, <laughs> Gordy has jumped ahead of us. I'm going to get to the root of it here. Uh, man, once again, it's fascinating to see some old things that really haven't changed much since uh, 1926. Original ceiling, original handrails, original light fixtures. Light fixtures? Pretty much. That probably has been redone a couple times, but... This as, I, is, as I said, the only person willing to come down here is a meter reader. So, the meter reader and Cody Little, <laughs> Calvin Castine. Oh my goodness, it's nice and toasty down here, Calvin. And watch your head. And this this would have been their root cellar, uh, pretty much the way it was constructed in 1926. Um, there were some bends down here at one point, but uh, it now houses our hot water, our cold water, the heating for the winter, the air conditioning for the summer, which is most of the pipes you see running through here. Uh, as I said, we're not skimping for space here, so anything we can use, we're using. I would dare say the vast majority of the 1,800-some souls who work here today have never been standing where we are <laughs> right now. I'm guessing 90% of the hospital has never seen this, including the people that work in this area have probably never seen this area. And anybody who's over six feet tall may may want to wear a special hard hat when he comes down here. This is amazing. There actually is one more chamber beyond us, uh, and it's actually probably a, maybe a foot again smaller than this. And I'm guessing the only people that would have come down here at that point were the cooks, and this was for whatever things they were trying to keep fresh for the week or whatever. So you know, it's probably nice and cool down here, a standard 56 or 7 degrees at all times so underground. That's pretty neat. Which is about 30 degrees cooler than what it is now. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's toasty here. <laughs> this is great. Let's move on. You're looking at a picture of the North Solarium on the seventh floor of what's now CVPH Medical Center. And as we've told you so many times today and in the past, this was kind of an incredible facility even 75 years ago. And it's so much fun to go fast forward all those pictures into 2001 in late August and to look into the nooks and crannies and what did my mother call them? Cubby holes. <laughs> and we have come to a cubby hole on the seventh floor having looked at that grandiose view of that solarium we come to a door and some steps and Storage. what we didn't even know was another door until we saw the doorknob and Hal put a key in it and turned it take us where we're going I want to see if Calvin can stay on his two feet walking through this little tiny space as we go out onto the roof and fortunately the weather is quite nice today with sunshine, I'll follow you because you know where the beams are. 
pretty well solid. But oh, it is, huh? What? <laughs> I'll let you know. If I suddenly become four feet tall, you'll know you were wrong. Oh, my God. Look at this view. Isn't this neat? This would have been nicer with the story and a half all glass solariums that were here. Oh, yeah. Now, for well, whatever, this is where they were, right this here. This is exactly what you're looking at is what would have been the um, story and a half solariums. Uh, as you look at the area over here, this is the area that would have been the boardroom, uh, which where when the they, roof is. Yes, where it, which is now roof. Both solariums on the north and the south and the boardroom for whatever reason at the time of the remodeling in the 50s or the 70s was decided that these these had to come off whether it was for structural or whatever yeah. these were torn off it was made roof the boardroom was torn off the roof be, uh, was made the large seven story white pillars that were in the front were knocked down yeah and they were knocked no down as mariana told us and uh, that was quite a day when they came down we still would like to find some photograph still photographs or moving shots of when that day happened this is absolutely incredible to walk around on the top of where the old solarium was in the seventh floor and you can see for a long long ways uh, the view off in this direction is uh, from uh, Beekman Beekman Towers a 13-story building on the that end of town you can see the to the right the cogeneration plant down behind the Georgia Pacific Mill and everybody's front yards and backyards. It's really, really neat to be up here because it gives you a view that people have never seen before. And I dare say, Michael, you probably never came through that door in your life, did you? Never through that door, uh, certainly not. I mean, some of the things and some of the places we're going to later on, I've, I've been, but uh, Hal knows many more cubby holes and nooks and crannies than I do. I was wondering, would you want to go over and try to do a guesstimate as to where you think the tunnel comes in? which you can uh, probably see from here. I, I, I have a shot. There. I think we want to go right dead out here. All right. Calvin, just watch this uh, vent in the middle here. And we've added a neoprene roof, and that yep. hopefully is what stops the leaking. If it looks like rubber, it is rubber. Yeah, that's right. Now, what we're looking at here is the single lot with the arrows. That's the doctor's parking lot. And I'm guessing probably somewhere about the single row here in the lawn area is about where the gentleman when they did the digging excavating where they hit the tunnel uh-huh right over here to the left a little bit the road cars is in the lawn area where the trees are in this center this little mall area that's about it huh? that's about my well yeah, i remember that's about yeah, where they yeah. hit the tunnel oh. which would have put it in this area here you know, I can remember going through it many times, but as Mary Ellen said, you just don't pay attention when you're doing it, you know? Well, I think some of us forget that these things are not going to be here forever, and we always assume that there's going to be a tunnel here, and I don't know yeah. a lot of employees would like to see that tunnel back. <laughs> Who knows what the view will be from here 75 years from now? I mean, you know, just this vista. Kevin Carroll mentioned vistas when we were talking about them, and the reason we come to the North Country and find it hard to go away and can't wait to come back home. Look at the church steeples, St. Peter's and St. John's churches. Uh, look at the McDonough Monument, stately in the, right in the center. I just uh, found somebody who's got a copy of when that monument was dedicated in the early second decade of the 20th century. Look at the incredible Lake Champlain, Cumberland Head, the Vermont shoreline, the fabulous green mountains in silhouette against a perfectly beautiful blue sky with just a few thin lines of clouds. Absolutely incredible. The, there's always been a pond here from since the very beginning, and you saw some of the shots across the pond, but this has been expanded down through the years, and it's a pretty neat place for patients and their families, Michael. Oh, yeah, we're very, very proud of the lawn and the <clears throat> the animals and the opportunity that's afforded here for families to come, especially with their little ones, and feed the ducks and the geese and the deer. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, maybe you'd call it a poor man's zoo, 
But we, we think it's, it's, it's very important and, and certainly as we bring people in here, as we recruit people from other parts of the country, they're amazed at the facilities we have that I think sometimes we take for granted. Yeah, I think it would be pretty hard to view this even on your 13 or 21 or 54 inch television screen would pretty be pretty hard to take this whole thing for granted. Uh, this view behind us, of course, is uh, what you might have seen in 1926 on the back side there. Right? Well, and I, I think Hal may actually have plans to take us up there. So uh, oh, what, really? you're, what you're seeing right now, we're going to be on top very shortly. Well, let's do that too. Now you look in that picture and you can see the boardroom. You can see where the solarium was to the right hand side and just kind of make believe it's here today because we're standing right there where it would have been. What a beautiful shot of then and now from 1926 to August 2001. Just as we shut the camera down, you pointed out something that I hadn't even seen, and that is the, the roof line. You can still see the roof line for the solarium, which was, I say, a story and a half, on the cement, in the cement where it kind of changes color. So it's, even that remains. Isn't that neat? And we're on another side of the building. What are we looking at? You're looking at the very back of the north side of the building, and what you're looking at now at the very far side here, the brand new ER construction, and then to the front of that is the MRI construction that we did, which in you know 1926 you wouldn't have seen that. What you would have seen is a lot of empty lawn and farm field. And some of those old photographs uh, that that show a far off view so show that there wasn't much around here at that time. Yeah, pretty much uh, what we have behind us here is prospect, and of course as we go over here we have uh, Boynton and whatever. Those were not here. Yeah. All you had was farm field and pasture and uh, a lot of green space. All right, we're, we're in the hallway now, and how you were talking about the splash guards along the wall up here on the seventh floor. Yeah, this was this is pretty much original, except for the drop ceiling, which you're, you're now missing about two feet of ceiling. Oh, you are. But this is, of course, we have run all the wires and pipes that we needed above here for heating and ventilation. Uh, they didn't do that in 26, so you're missing about two feet. But you have the original hallway. There's been no doors added here. This is pretty much the way it would have been. Uh, the original two elevators that were here. That's, uh, you, you said that you had a feeling, you've always been told this might have been Mr. Miner's elevator. One, one was Mr. Miner's elevator, one was the employee's elevator, or the doctor's, because we're on the seventh floor, this is where you would have been to come to view uh, an OR, because yeah. uh, the amphitheaters are here. Um, I know from the years I've been here, the 18, 19 years, this elevator seems to want to take you to eight no matter when you get on it no matter where you push it. the button it takes you to eight that's a wonderful quirky little thing and it's like the old man is pushing the button saying wait a minute he i want you to stop here he just wants you to see his old office <laughs> so that's my thought is that he, he just wants you to go for the ride now going down it'll stop anywhere you want it's going Coming up it's going to go to eight uh, these this elevator is still in use uh, in fact we call it the er elevator the elevator that was here we have since removed um, for whatever reason and this it probably won't show much. This is where all our computer and electrical telephone lines run now. So instead of seeing an elevator. Oh my, let Calvin get over my shoulder and just kind of take a peek in there. Boy, we're, we're, we're showing these things that wouldn't even been show, be shown on a public tour, but that's certainly looks like an elevator shaft, doesn't it, huh? And it's, <coughs> we, oh, we, we put in a great floor to the, so that you can stand in here, and then the telephone lines, the computer lines, um, pretty much whatever lines we could run down here. That's now we have this nice, you know, six foot by six foot chase. Let's use it. Isn't that neat? Do you get a shot down through that great? Ooh, baby. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're three, seven floors up. Actually, this one on this stops in two, so you wouldn't have been able to get down to the first floor. But then again, the first floor back in '26 was actually the basement. The second floor was your first floor. I got you. So, amphitheater's next. All right, let's go. This is a very important photograph that we're showing right now uh, on the screen, wait before you open the door, and let's just talk about this. That photograph that we're looking at on our screen now is a construction of 
the amphitheaters, which were actually, the OR was on the sixth floor, but in 1926, he believed that there should be more of a teaching hospital, it and you, you should be able to view the surgeries. So Mr. Minor constructed what was then four amphitheaters. Uh, if you can see the rings, there are four distinct rings in the pictures. Uh, there were three small amphitheaters, one large amphitheater. Uh, the one that's always used in the, in the photos that you see is the one that the amphitheater goes right to the very wall itself. Uh, and the other most three of those you can't view now because they're being used for something else. Uh, their construction th changed them they, considerably. There's no floor in them. So you can actually... Well, that in, makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> down below us is a skilled nursing. So when you look down below, you'll see a drop ceiling. That is a skilled nursing facility. And what still remains are the poured seats. Oh, no. So it's, it's half and half. The light trees are still here. Inside each light housing was uh, two sets of lights, which I've seen at some point. There was... Well, let, let's look at this photograph next because... Uh, I want to capture this on the screen to get a people an idea of what the old doctors discussed uh, a long time ago. Not a lot of light. In fact, this is probably what you're going to get. Oh, no, no kidding. You can't add much more to it either. I don't know if you can get anything in here. Oh, Calvin's got it. All right, now this gives a perfect design, and I have to tell you that this is a wonderful and unique experience for me because I've wanted to come up here in all the years for the last 40 years in Plattsburgh, and this is my first opportunity. Let me step to the other side of Calvin and have Hal describe what we're looking at here. What you're looking at is a picture that you normally see. This is the one amphitheater that, if you look, the, this extends right to what then would have been a triple set of pane windows which held the heat in, kept the, it let a lot of sun in, but it kept this room at very climate controlled. Um, the box in the center here held a double set of lights. There was an outer ring of white lights, and then for whatever reason, they had an inner set of colored lights, which were colored lenses, which I'm not sure what they would have used them for, but uh, the circle that you're looking for in, through down below, that is what would have been the OR, which is now our uh, skilled nursing facility. So you're actually looking kind of into somebody's room. Isn't that neat? And you see the poured cement seats, yep, so you know where students sat way back when in the 19, solid. in the 19, their solid is, is right, absolutely incredible. Steps go all the way down. Uh, these probably could have sat in them, but it, to me they, they lend themselves more to standing and kind of leaning in. Um, goes, extends right, again right to the wall on both sides. The other three do not, they stop very short of this. And uh, this is exactly the way it would have been. The color is the same. This is set up exactly the way it would have been. You know, it pleases me so much that there are remnants of the original Physician's Hospital here. And what better time during the 75th anniversary to go and check out all this stuff? And what better person to, to lead the parade than Hal? How, I thank you so much. This is such a neat experience. And as, I, as I said again, you get curious when you work here, and that's... I, I would dare to say that probably 90% of the employees that work here don't know this is here. No. They never do. Uh, like I say again, if you look, the, the wood on the doors is the same. You still have the mahogany wood. This one room is, is unique in that it had, if, you, if they were filming an operation, this has its own dark room, which is what you see behind us. Oh, no the, kidding. The dark room is still here. Oh, so when you, open, if, when you open this door, this, let me just give you a quick. Sure, look at the handles and the. Oh, isn't that neat? Of course, we're, we're housing other things, but if you, this has a light. Oh, let's see if we can. Okay. Let's see how they've, they've tried to keep it as dark as possible. And if they were filming an operation, this is probably where they would have developed it or stored it until they were ready. And original mahogany around the doors, original handles, original light fixtures. This is pretty much what you would have seen in 1926, wow. except for the absorber. <laughs> yeah, except, <laughs> yeah, a little piece of modern technology in 2001. This is absolutely beautiful. And you, we've some, seen some of this wood in the, in the photographs, folks. And that's what it looks like all these years later, pretty durable stuff. They, yeah. I think they wanted it to be around for a it while. It was made to last. And actually before, uh, to bring the, this, these rooms up to code, we've replaced the outer doors with a thicker metal door. The original uh, mahogany doors that were there had a 
kind of a frosted window in them, and I wish we'd save one, but underneath each door there, on the inside was printed on hours when you could come in and view. And they were still the original printing that you could come in between 10 and 12 and 2 and 4, and it was in a frame on the door. I love it. We're just uh, talking behind the scenes while Calvin was getting a um, static shot of the OR that we just viewed at, and we realized that, uh, you know, if you had surgery here 30 years ago, you possibly had surgery right in that amphitheater, right? Yeah, 30 to 40 years ago. Yeah, 30 to 40 years ago or more. In the photograph, as you're looking to your upper left, you can see the bars around where we were just standing a very short time ago, far above that, looking down at the top tier. And you can see all those big windows that Hal talked about before, the operating table, what it was like down below. And now you know what it was like if you watch the old doctors talking about being able to glance over their shoulder and seeing that panoramic view outside the hospital. If you don't say, even this shot is done at night, it's still allowed for some light through. Even moonlight would have yeah. lit this room better than it was. I imagine the housekeepers that had to clean these windows. And it's very unique that, yeah, I can imagine. you. It's very unique that you should mention that they had color filters because not knowing exactly why, I'm thinking that when they do computer generations during operations, they and even when we take shots of outer space and planets, sometimes we change the colors for perspective so you get a better contrast. And maybe that's what it was Could very about. well have been. Uh, I know that when we did one of the rooms, we had to remove one of the boxes. And when the inner lights came out, they were a series of red and blue lenses. So maybe it helped better for filming, better for viewing things. But that's those inner boxes. We shouldn't even oh, mention oh, oh. those things because you know that there are at least 10 or 15 people watching this are going to know what they were they all about. They will know what those were for. <laughs> and they'll say, Gordy, come on, give us a break. In any case, this is, this is absolutely a terrific tour. Uh, next, how about we go see where the School of Nursing was? Okay. We're up on the roof again, about 10 feet higher than we were before. Uh, and the reason we came out onto the roof again through this tiny door behind us is because you believe this is where... Uh, Mr. Miners would have had his office. He would have had a little satellite office here to work from. Uh, would have been off the 8 West. Uh, we just came through off his, what I said, what I believe was his elevator, uh, which is why it always likes to take you up here. This would have been where he would have maintained some kind of little satellite office to maintain what was going on here. Still on the eighth floor, that mysterious eighth floor where the elevator stops, whether anybody wants it to or not, where Mr. Minor would get off. And we're in the School of Nursing. This is right now, this is the School of Radiology, which you have radi radiology in here. And on the other side, you have the OR text. That the picture we're looking at on the screen. In 1926 would have been the School of Nursing, which is they actually lived on site here, studied on site here, and this would have been classrooms for them. So that where Alice Repis and Mary de Gregory went to school in the 1930s and graduated in 1934, they walked these floors. Probably several times a day. Uh, what we maintained here was, as you're looking at this area here, is mostly classroom. As you go through the back part here and then up to eight and nine would have been their residence. That, a lot of the pictures that you see where they lived on site, there was a dorm room for either one or two students. So these, these doors would essentially go through the same openings as they did in 1926, you think? Uh, this one, yes. Uh, if you can see on the sides here, you can still see where the columns were. Yes. That that would have been an open classroom. An open classroom uh, in here, okay. Uh, the windows we have redone uh, later to add, they you know, keep the heat in. But these are essentially, you're looking at the classrooms that these people would have sat in. I love so. it. I love it. What a great piece of history. Then we climbed uh, almost like a ladder of stairs, a metal stairs to get up into the ninth floor to the actual rooms where those students, student nurses, lived in 1926 and for quite a few years after that, once this facility was built. And Hal told us that there were how many rooms on each floor? About there were six rooms on each floor, would have housed a minimum of one, two, possibly depending on the room. So room for 24 students between the two floors, 12 on each floor. Okay. Um, 
pretty much the original doors. We've painted over them a few times. This is one of the, the rooms that we're looking at. Every room has been assigned to a department, and what they're doing is the things that they don't have room on the floor, they end up in one of these rooms. This room is unique in that this is the original plumbing. All right, let me just step in so Calvin can get a look at that original plumbing. Isn't that neat? Look at and the old faucets. There's, there's a setup, as I said, Mr. Meyer, that had to have the best of everything and things that would probably still work today and oh. probably that probably will function. Isn't that amazing? So admit, yeah. admit it to last. The interior of these rooms essentially hasn't changed. They're just used for different purposes down through the years. So our viewers can get an idea of the size of the, of the rooms outside the bathroom. And you can imagine in here one or two beds. You probably would have had a bed by the window, maybe a bed against the corner here, uh, a desk here where they would have worked at, or maybe a small table over here, uh, a bureau where they would have stored things. There's a closet behind us, a small closet. And you know, two girls would have probably spent maybe a year or two in here learning to be a nurse and would have either really liked each other or really hated each other, one or the other. I don't know, I talked about Mary to Gregory and Alice Repis who met only because they came to school here on the first day in the early 1930s and have been the closest of friends ever since. And this, this would have actually encouraged that you would have had to like the person you were living yeah. with and this would do it. That's pretty good. I, for those of you who are voyeurs and like to sneak in places and look in basements and cubby holes and rooms, boy, oh boy, oh boy. Hal said when we walked in, when folks speak about visiting the penthouse at CVPH Medical Center, this is it, folks. It may not be glorious today, but this is the top of the world. It has little alcoves and cubby holes here. Who knows what they were used for way back when? Probably back then they were storing whatever they needed for roofing tile, for extra material. Uh, you're looking at the original planking. planking. Uh, what was here was an air shaft. Um, I, say, I wish I had the key for this, but behind us here in this door, uh, which was the actual size of the door, was one of the original wooden stairways, fire escapes that now drops down 10 flights and there's a little landing on each one and i'm not sure i'd even want to look down there let alone go down there but if you did it i would follow you just for fun who knows uh, there is a way to open that and there you can look way. down there the only person i've ever actually seen do this is our resident plumber bill smith and i've seen him use it and he says it's just as safe as the day it was built i'm taking his word for it yeah sure he probably weighs about 135 pounds soaking wet that's pretty close <laughs> <laughs> but you can get a look at these windows we've seen old photographs of these windows goodness knows where that glass came from in 1926 when the place was built but we've seen those in many of the old photographs this is a, a design that was unique to this building uh, he wanted this to have a castle like appearance this is we're kind of in the turret if you want to think of that we're in the turret that's why it has these odd shapes uh, the original heating registers are in the side here. Uh, this is pretty much the way it looked, except for the addition of our, uh, what you're looking at now is all our uh, telemetry for the, uh, the radios that we use here. Yeah, uh, Calvin is getting a view of the, uh, the old radiators there for the hot water heat from way back when, and I'm sure they're original. That's, the, nothing has been touched here, so that would be the 1926 radiator. And I say, outside of the few additions we've made for the, the one basic hot water line we're running, the, the, some of the lines you're looking at is our f new fire suppression system. And then the, our paging system runs off the roof. Uh, the radios for the uh, ER, the radios for the facilities department are all based here. So when somebody says they need to get to the roof to fix something, this is where they want to come. I'm sure this tour is not only fascinating for people who just want to know a little bit about the history, but for those people who are in the construction business or for all, old time retired construction people and engineers and it's conceivable that some of the people who worked on this building oh they'd be pretty old by now but it's conceivable that they could still be alive well that could very well be and that's you figure they'd be probably in their late 90s but it, it's hey we're living longer and here you know, here's an excellent idea of how they put these bricks together how they laid things in why this building is still standing 85 years later and it's structurally sound or we wouldn't be standing here. You can count on that. Engineers know about those things. And that this is, you figure every floor has somewhere between a foot and a foot and a half of cement between the floors. The walls are extremely thick. Even though they're using brick, the brick is at least double layered in some areas. So you're talking probably a half a foot of brick. This, this was built. Entire place. It has to do with the history. 
The only thing I can think of that you haven't been in yet is the uh, cistern in the dungeon. Oh, the cistern in the dungeon? That's the very, the bowels of the basement. The hospital actually maintained its own water supply, uh, maintained its own uh, cold water and things, and it was here. Had its own well, had its own supply you of water. you got to be kidding. So that's, it's the last place I know of that's original and just has not changed much of what you're looking at. Many of our viewers probably never heard that word cistern before. <laughs> well, you heard it now today, folks, right? I know I had not until I started working here. When the guys are referred to the cistern and stay away from the cistern, I now know where that is. Well, 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 this has uh, turned out to be a real discovery tour because Hal hasn't been here before. Mike Hildebrand said, what's that piece of equipment inside that door? Hal said, what door? We opened the door and stepped over a threshold, which is about almost uh, 19 inches high, and we looked into the room, a bricked-in room, and saw something that we have no idea what it might be, a, some kind of a standpipe with an arm on it and a collection unit on top. So Hal says, oh, probably for rainwater. Come on, you made that up. Uh, yes, you're right, I made that up. <laughs> but the, you've never looked in here before. This is one of the areas, at every tour, I find something different. Mike has to get credit for this one. That is something I've never seen, and probably one of our plumbers would have to identify that. We're on the roof, so or at least the next stop up's the roof. God knows what that is. If any of our viewers have any clue as to what that is, contact Calvin Castine. Look in your phone book under hometown, two separate words, hometown cable, 298-4663, and give them an idea what it is, and we'll pass it along to our viewers on a, at a future time. I dare say this little room, this old piece of equipment, and much of what you've seen today you have never seen on television, in photographs, or anywhere before. And who knows, this may be the only time you'll ever see it. So enjoy and bring the kids around and get a little history lesson as we get toward the conclusion of this edition of Our Little Corner. All right, this is the, you can see the, the wheels turning and the cables turning. This is. Uh, Basically, what one of the original elevator penthouses would have looked like, Hal. This is the original building. Uh, we have not changed the outside of the building. What you see inside is the you know, the additions that we've done to the elevators to keep them up. Uh, but you know the new electronics, which before this would not have existed, you just would have had a pulley system here. But now we have the new pulley system installed, the electronics that make it work. And you know people when they they say the you know, the one cable is going to break and let me drop, you can see that there's actually seven or eight cables holding you up. It's so incredible, and big motors and everything works very, very smoothly. And there are how many of these penthouses, two? There are two penthouses on this side. This is the old side of the building. So you have the, we're standing in the large Otis side. Behind you is the small Otis. Uh, across is where we have the ER, Mr. Miner's elevator. Yeah. That's the one across from us. And basically the buildings have not changed. We, we just keep redoing the inside. And that's what you see in the right direction. We are indeed on the top of the world. It doesn't get much higher than this. This is CVPH. A, this is the 11th floor. It's as high as you can get. Uh, Mr. Miner designed this building to have that kind of turret style castle effect in the middle. We are at the top. We're at the turret and originally you could see through some of the turret areas. We've since blocked it up so it's roughly six feet all the way around. And that's why uh, Calvin is holding the camera above his head. Calvin's a little afraid of heights. And I offered to pick him up there and put him on the next ledge, and he respectfully declined. I'd have passed on that one, too. We have no idea what that camera was just showing people out there. <laughs> and we'll see it for the first time when it gets on television, I can guarantee you that. Oh, boy, and the mountains on that side. Pretty, pretty incredible place we live in, isn't in, it? In 1926, to have a building that was, well, 11 stories plus, you know, if you're on the roof here, 11 and a half, this had to be one of the tallest buildings in Plattsburgh. And the view here at that point would have covered, I'm guessing, right down to Cumberland Head, um, halfway out to Beekman Town, halfway out to the, the Air Force Base. And as you can see, any mountain you want to take a look at, there it is. In terms of buildings with people in them, this absolutely was the tallest building in Plattsburgh at that time. We now have 13-story towers 
and uh, all of that stuff. But boy, oh boy, just to get a, a look at this building inside and out, and I mean inside and out, from 1927 to 2001 is a kick for me, and I hope it is for you too. In the words of an old Chubby Checker song, how low can you go? This, where you can't go any lower here, can you, Hal? This is, we're actually one, one floor below ground level, and we're actually the ground level here, but we're one floor below the building. This is as low as you can go, the dungeon, the cistern, uh, whatever you wanted to call this. We this were looking at some pipes here, and there's water still dripping out of these pipes that comes out of the ground groundwater that still drips into here and, yeah. and drains out. Yeah, this is where it would have been collected. Uh, the hospital was designed to have its own water supply that no matter what happened, the hospital was pretty much self-sufficient. This is what we, they call the sister, and there's an area behind us that's kind of blocked off, but it, this is where the hospital, they would have collected the water, it would have been used for their laundry, for whatever they were using the water for. As uh, many old homes, as I've talked to young kids often about how old homes had cisterns, either metal or, or a poured uh, cement sisters, cisterns in their basement. Collection units up on the roof where the rainwater would come down into the cistern, there would be a pump in the hand pump in the kitchen, and that's what you used for everything but drinking. And now we're standing on the poured cement area, which there would have been a series of pumps here, which you're looking through what, what we've cracked out of here, which is now, it's dead storage again. And these, there would have been a set of pumps here, which would have pumped the water out of here up to the hospital. Unbelievable. And over behind uh, where Michael is standing is where the actual cisterns were located. Yes. It's actual, it, Again, if I had the key to the that door, I'd probably be Mr. Carroll. <laughs> there, there would be another one, yeah. Yes, would be the larger of the two. And it's interesting because as we walk through these hallways, upstairs and downstairs, there's always the remnants of things that were. Right now, but these were, or some of them were, were connected and in use back in those days. That is probably something that up until the 50s yeah. was probably here and in use. And then as we redid things, that as we're running newer areas, as you can see, the groundwater still running here. That's as much as we wanted to get out of here, so that remains. Now, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to say goodbye to both of you gentlemen now, and Calvin and I are going to go out front on our way to the parking lot and wrap it up with a, just a, an out front view of CVPH Medical Center as it is today. I want to shake your hand, Hal. Thank you for You're your interest. You're one of the best guides we've ever had anywhere. This was a masterful job. You've learned a lot about what you do, and you're a valuable resource. I thank you so much. Well, I thank you. This was fun, and as I was telling you earlier, that most of what I've got here came from the employees that worked here. It's the older employees that, when I'd have a question, they would answer. And unfortunately, I'm now becoming one of the older employees, and <laughs> I don't have any resources hard left. for me to believe. <laughs> and you got lots of resources left. Don't worry Holy. about that. Hal Mira, after 19 years, you've collected that information. We wish, as part of this Diamond Jubilee series at CVPH, we could have interviewed all those old employees. And I want to thank all those people who got all these lists of names for us. We had ambitious ideas when we started talking about doing the Diamond Jubilees. But you know what? You get two people like the nurses, you get seven or eight people like the old doctors, and you start to tape. And you aren't gonna, you're going to work through lunch. You're going to go into the next century. I think we did. <laughs> and, and we did very well with almost a two-hour program. Mike Hildebrand, thank you so much for being a good friend over the years, for joining us today, for carrying the extra books. It was for, a heavy book, Gordy. <laughs> and for, for uh, showing us things that even Hal didn't know existed. Uh, I pulled that <laughs> one out of something that or other. beautiful. That was beautiful. It's really been a good experience, and we hope that this uh, um, picture that we're making today, this videotape, will be a piece of CVPH history so that other generations can look back and see what we did in 2001. Won't it be fun? Oh, absolutely. And I was talking to Calvin a couple of days ago. What we'd really like to do is invite you back in the fall, and we've looked at all this historical stuff, and, you know, sort of laughed and said, my gosh, what is it? Now, we've, we've done some tremendous things as far as adding technology here in 2001 with a new MRI that will be installed uh, sometime near the end of October, two new CAT scans, an all-new echocardiographic system. Very high-tech, 
that I think your viewers would like to see, but think from the standpoint of what people would say 75 years from now Hello. about what we're calling as cutting edge in 2001. I it's love it. startling. And we'll plan it right now. Great. What a day, what a life. I could almost sing the song. I told you we we're going to wrap it up on the front lawn. Well, actually, I'm on the tarmac and Calvin's almost on the lawn. This is what CVPH Medical Center looks like today. Look over to your right and you can see the remnants of 1926. The old pillars aren't there anymore, but the old spirit is still here. Couldn't you feel it? Huh? On that elevator that always stops on the eighth floor. Think about that for a golden moment. Think about what you view today and tell your friends about it. And uh, if you have information that you'd like to supply, or if you know about when the pillars came down and had some movies of it, please contact us. We're going to step out to keep from becoming a statistic to end our program here today. But we hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Our thanks to Kevin Carroll, president and CEO of this organization, who will soon be leaving uh, for joining us at the beginning today. Our thanks to Mary Ellen Everleth, who's been here for 38 years, and her tenure will also end. Our thanks to Hal Miro, who took us on this tremendous tour. To Mike Hildebrand, uh, who is in charge of public information at this uh, great facility, for allowing us to come in here and uh, be a part of the CVPH Medical Center family. And happy 75th birthday to Physicians Hospital. It all started right in these beautiful acres in 1926. And who knows where we're going to be next time for our little corner.